<laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. The thing that that really gets me about these storms is if you watched on the Weather Channel, they showed this boiling cauldron of electric, you know, lightning and all this stuff, and it showed the the wind and it showed the water, which was really amazing to me how much that damage that did. And if you were on Sanibel Island, you still are. Uh, the road completely washed out and everything. And we can have that, and a day or two later, we have this. You know, God is just amazing. The power, uh, if, you, if you read the president's letter, uh, he talked about God's power. And just amazing, the power of God. Okay. The title of my split sermon today is Christian Soldier or ambassador for Christ. You know, the word soldier, singular, in the King James, or New King James, is mentioned um, seven times in the New Testament. And the first time, I'll just go over a couple of these, uh, probably pretty familiar with them. First time is in John 19, and that talks about the Roman soldiers dividing Jesus clothing, his garments. The second time is in Acts 10 and verse 7, where Cornelius sends for Peter. And this is also talking about a Roman soldier. The third time is in Acts 28 and verse 16, when Paul was in Rome and guarded by a Roman soldier. The fourth time is in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, when Paul was commending Epaphroditus as a fellow soldier. So this is different. He is, a, he is not a Roman soldier. He is a Christian soldier. The fifth and sixth times are back-to-back -back scriptures in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And it, again, it talks, um, well, let me read that real quick. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And the seventh time, the last time, is in the uh, book of Philemon, chapter 1, verse 1. And Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphpia, our, Chip, our Chippipus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So out of those those seven times that soldier is, is listed in the New Testament, only four of them are talking about Christian soldiers. In the New Testament, the word soldiers, plural, is listed, is mentioned, excuse me, 24 times, and every one of those times, it's talking about a Roman soldier. So what exactly is a Christian soldier? Does a Christian soldier fight God's battles for him? How does the words, what, what does the soldier mean, word soldier mean anyway, Christian soldier? And those seven times that it's soldiers mentioned in the New Testament, there are different words just very small differences meaning different things but the um, the clearest idea I got out of all of that is the fact that in the New Testament for Christian soldier it means to be enlisted to be a warrior now, I don't know about you but when I think about warrior 
I think about somebody like a gladiator or somebody like uh, Goliath or somebody like David, somebody that fights kind of on an individual basis, hand to hand, somebody that <clears throat> I, I just don't see soldiers marking, marching in ranks as a, as a warrior. You know, a superhero is a warrior, I guess. Does God want or need us to do battle for him? I'd like to do today is to look at some scriptures to see what we can find out about being a Christian soldier and also an ambassador for Christ. So we know what is expected of us. Does God need us as his church to be the kind of soldiers that take up arms and do battle? If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'll try and scoot this over. And starting in verse 50. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? And he's talking to Judas. Judas is betraying Jesus at this point. Then, then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And I'm thinking that he wasn't really aiming at his ear. <laughs> but Jesus said, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Verse 53, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? And I looked up what a legion was. And legion is a division of a Roman army comprising somewhere between three and 6,000 soldiers. That would mean at Christ's disposal somewhere between 36 and 72,000 angels just by asking his father. It doesn't really seem to me that he needs us to do battle for him. What would be the purpose? Now, I've known people, this is kind of funny, I've known people that are really desperate to help God, to win the battle for the lost. Like he's not capable of doing what he planned for himself. They're always looking to lead someone in the sinner's prayer to bring them into the fold. Seemingly ignoring a couple of Stan's favorite scriptures. John 6, chapter, or verse 44, and verse 45. That's where it says, No one can come to me unless the Father draw him. And in verse 65, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me if it, unless it has been granted by my Father. I actually, there are some, some of those people that I know um, have talked, I don't, you know, and talk is cheap, talked about stockpiling ammunition as a Christian soldier. <clears throat> One of them boasted that he was going to get 3,000 rounds of ammunition. And I'm thinking, if his house ever catches on fire, he's going to wipe out half of the county he lives in. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And in verse 11. It says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. 
He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It sounds to me like he's pretty much got everything under control. <laughs> Let's go uh, back to Book of John. John chapter 18, John 18 and verse 36. This is when Pilate was questioning Jesus, you know, whether he's a king or whatever. And in verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So what exactly is our responsibility as Christian soldiers then? You turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Our first concern is to be able to stand against the attacks of Satan, the devil. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. I don't think 3,000 rounds of ammunition is going to do a whole lot of good against principalities and powers and spiritual beings. Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. So Paul is going to tell us what our uniform will be as a Christian soldier. As we look, in the, look at the armor of God, we will see that protection from Satan is why the armor of God is defensive and not offensive, for the most part. Now, if you were to ask Nefty, if he were here, what percentage of a boxing match do you spend on defense as opposed to the amount of time on offense? I think his offer would his answer would, would be that it depends on your opponent. Now, if you are fighting somebody like Fred Astaire that dances around, <laughs> real cool, you know, that's, you would be on offense more often. But if you fight somebody like a windmill that has a hundred fists coming at you, you're going to be on defense. And honestly, what I know about boxing, when you are in a boxing ring, you are always on defense, no matter whether you're on offense or not. It's just like a lot of different sports, like soccer, for instance. There's always a defense on soccer. Correct? There's somebody standing in that goal. Every once in a while I watched a, a hockey game and at the end when they're trying to catch up and they pull the guy out of the goal and they go down and they try and get the score and then somebody gets loose and the goal's wide open and it's just, it's a, you gotta have defense. 
All right. So let's look at verse 14 then. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. I don't know about you, but my waist would be a pretty big target. And it's easy to inflict pain and kind of slow somebody down if you get to their waist or midsection. <clears throat> having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, that is a defensive thing. I, I know quite a few men in, that have been in law enforcement. And I tell you that the training that they have is if you ever have to get in a, a battle like that, a gun battle, you, you don't aim like the cowboys did to shoot the gun out of somebody's hand. You aim for critical mass, the largest part, largest target. Verse 15 says, Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And um, I know a lot of people can tell you that if your feet aren't working, you're pretty much having a problem, especially if you're fighting for whatever. You know, my daughter, I told you I just got back with her. And she's had, she had part of her foot amputated. And she, she is suffering big time. I mean, she can't, that's another point, but your feet are very important. So you protect your feet as well. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And that shield of faith was a big shield that would actually, if they, you know, burning arrows or whatever, would actually stick in the shield and protect you. They also had a small shield that if you were in hand-to-hand -hand battle, it would be something that you could use to protect yourself. Hand-to-hand -hand battle was a lot different back then, I think. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. And anyone that has fallen off a motorcycle knows that a helmet is a very important piece of equipment to have, defensive equipment. And the sword of the spirit. Now we're getting to offensive weapons. Kind of. Because if you've ever seen a sword fight, you swing once and then you keep everybody else away swinging at you so it's it's offensive but it's also defensive constantly defensive and that sword of the spirit is the word of god and when jesus was in the wilderness and satan came to him and offered him all these things what was his weapon it is written the word of god and it was one of these, you know, again, the word of God is, is defensive, um, but it can also be offensive. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know, court was talking about praying for each other. I think, personally, I think this time where we are now in this life, that is hugely important. We really need to be praying for each other. Verse 19, he continues, and for me, so Paul's asking for prayer for himself. We should be praying for Mr. Veller. We should be praying for all the pastors. It's amazing to me how thin this pastors are spread in this church. I mean, two and three congregations, 100 plus miles apart. It's just, it's amazing. So they need that prayer. Paul said, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20 says, for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly 
as I ought to speak. So now we get to see what an ambassador is. An ambassador is a diplomatic agent of the highest rank, accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his own, his or her own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. An accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. If you turn with me to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five. See a little bit more about an ambassador here. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse sixteen. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer thus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who is reconciled who has reconciled to us himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And I would like to read that verse from the complete Jewish Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, the complete Jewish Bible. Therefore, we are ambassadors of the Messiah. God is making his, I'm sorry, in effect, God is making his appeal through us. What we do is appeal on behalf of the Messiah. Be reconciled to God. So we should be both a Christian soldier fighting against Satan and his demons with prayer and supplication and God's word. And we should be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, diplomatically influencing those who come, we come in contact with to get them to see and understand that there is a better way to live and a vibrant kingdom coming that they can be part of. So put on the armor of God and use prayer and the word of God to withstand the wiles of the devil. We need to protect ourselves against Satan and his demons. And prepare to go into the world as an ambassador for Jesus Christ, making a difference in the lives of those you come in contact with every day. Have a great rest of your Sabbath.